Hi everyone, welcome to your week one feedback video for the, the psychology of uh, developmental psychology here on Future Learn with Monash University. Um, my name is Matt Mundy and I'm joined today by uh, Kiara, who's one of the mentors uh, within this, this uh, module. Uh, Oscar is your other mentor for this, uh, this particular course. Um, so Kiara and Oscar have been active on the forums talking uh, and chatting with many of you uh, with a lot of the questions you've had uh, within the, the course this week. Um, so, Chiara, what are some of the themes that people have been talking about? Well, one of the really important things that we've been looking at today is kind of some of the old theories that um, have come up out of development. So Piaget's Ages and Stages, the Vyotsky's um, Child Development one, and even going back to Freud and his kind of psychoanalytic theories and those sorts of things about development. And a few people were wondering how relevant that is today, like why we're learning this when especially like some of Freud's theories aren't really used that much in mm -hmm. therapy anymore. So what the point of going over some of this old, maybe outdated theories are? Well, I think it, it's a it's a perfectly reasonable question to be asking, and and I think that there's a there's a couple of there's a couple of reasons I think that we that we go over the history of psychology to to help. Um, those who are interested in the current state of the field kind of understand where we came from. Um, now, what, what, whilst many of the theories, particularly of Freud, are, are now not used, um, there was a whole field of psychology that came out of his work. Um, and a, a lot of um, where we are now, we wouldn't be there if it weren't for the, uh, the, the, the work that early psychologists uh, or psychoanalysts like Freud um, did. But that said, that there are still a few people around who 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 do practice psychoanalysis in the way that uh, that, that Freud originally intended, or sort of a version of it. And so, um, whilst yes, much of it has been debunked, um, it, it is uh, relevant to some people still today. But when you look at, um, say, Piaget and Vygotsky, for example. Um, some of that is still relevant, and there are um, many of the or many aspects of those theories that I think we use um, actively, for example, in schools or at universities, in, in sort of learning environments, um, in the way that those original theorists intended. So, in terms of um, Vygotsky and Piaget, for example, I mean they have been criticised for, you know, not considering individual differences, mm. not considering different class structures and those sorts of things, but could we use some of those theories or how could we see some of those theories used in, in schools, for example? I think I think we do see, um, particularly Piaget and, and to some extent Vygotsky as well, it, for example, in, in the way that school settings have changed over, even in the last couple of decades, but looking back uh, into the early 1900s and comparing to that today, uh, there's, there's a huge difference. So. It used to be that education was a, a one-way street and that the educator stood in front of the class and delivered their information and everyone assimilated that information in exactly the same way. Obviously, that, that's what was expected. Yeah. Quite a few of our learners commented that they themselves remembered their school days and how much rote learning and mm. the teacher standing up the front and expecting everyone to do the same thing. Yeah, so that came through with quite a few of our learners, actually. Absolutely, and, and I think university has been a, a particularly slow uh, area to catch up in that particular regard, and it's only 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 in the last decade, de de excuse me, decade or so, that, uh, that that university lectures have started moving away from that that sort of sage on the stage, one person <laughs> educating everyone because they know best, to a, a, a far more interactive way of learning. And I think it's that interaction that, that, particularly in the way that both of those theorists sort of considered how best we learn or how best we sort of uncover new information, and that's by interacting with that information with each other and allowing sort of the discovery for yourself mm -hmm. of some of that learning uh, and I think that's particularly important and that's that's where this came from. Yes, yep. Um, one of the other topics that seemed to generate a lot of interest and comments was the step on moral development mm -hmm. and looking at whether moral, like different levels of moral reasoning can be applied consistently and when they should be applied, especially in terms of decisions made in courts. So we had quite a lot of people saying that they did not believe that moral decision making really had much of a role in the decision making of a particular case. What do you, what do you think about that? I think it's tricky because there, there, there will be some cases that come before a court that are so unusual mm. and, and, and so far from the situation that that law was written to uh, govern or at least that law was written to control. Um, that 
a judge has no choice but to use a, another level of reasoning, that, that sort of stage six moral reasoning, because the, 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 the law just didn't envisage those particular set of circumstances all coming together. Um, but I guess my feeling on that is if that decision keeps coming up in the legal system, then it's, it shouldn't be the case that, that one individual is then given the, the, the right to make decisions based on um, their sort of moral standing and not the law. It should be the case that the law is changed mm. to take these things into account. And so, you know, the use of stage six or stage six of reasoning in, in the legal system should be reserved for the absolute sort of uh, extreme circumstances and, and, and other cases then the law should be changed based on those outcomes. Mm -hmm. One of the things we asked the learners to think about were the pros and cons of each of the levels of reasoning. Mm -hmm. And even though it's sort of put in this hierarchical order to suggest that level six is the best kind, quite a few of the learners mm -hmm. identified that because the levels aren't always applied consistently, especially in cases like in the legal system, that often it's the privileged few that get the benefit of that level six reasoning. And also a few comments, I suppose, on um, the the type yeah the types of people that are going to be getting that benefit. Mm -hmm. And I think I think that's that's the huge danger when you start bringing uh, sort of morality. And of course, lawmaking is about morality. Mm -hmm. But then you're going beyond what the words of that law suggest to, into a sort of personal interpretation of morality given by the judge in these cases. Then once you get to that personal level of thought process around the, the, the punishment or lack of that that person should be getting, then those internal biases of that individual mm. can then come to bear, which of course is exactly the opposite of what the legal system should be in terms of the interpretation of the law being applied to everyone. Yes. <laughs> um, and so, yes, of course, that, that level six then becomes, uh, as I said, the, a point at which we should apply in absolute extremes, um, but only then we should be considering the outcomes for changes in the law. Yes. I think some people as well noted that um, people who are consistently using that level six reasoning potentially have some of the traits of psychopaths mm -hmm. just because they're then putting themselves above the law. Because um, you probably know that the learners probably noticed that the, the moral development stages don't actually outline what universal morals we should be following mm -hmm. or the people in level six are following and potentially are looking at different different types of morals <laughs> Agreed. Yes, and I think it has certainly been the case that uh, well-known people on on high on the scale of psychopathy have uh, have, uh, have shown level six more reasoning, <laughs> but for reasons that uh, we would potentially not agree with. Indeed. Uh, so uh, I think we will leave it there. Yep. Um, thank you, everyone, for your engagement with the the content this week. It's been great. There there are I think over eighteen hundred people learning in this course this week at the moment. Uh, so well done for so many of you engaging with this. Um, I'd just like to remind you all that um, there are six uh, courses in this in this sequence of courses. This is just one of them. Uh, and if you complete all six courses in this sequence, you're eligible then to go into our assessment unit, which is the uh, currently running on the fifteenth of October so if this is your last uh, course in the sequence of six then you can go into that assessment unit on the 15th and if you pass those assessments uh, you are then given the opportunity to apply for the graduate diploma in psychology here at Monash and you will be given a unit's worth of credit into that course if your application was successful for completing these uh, these six modules on on future learn so have a think about that if you're interested in uh, further studies in psychology and an award course as part of uh, the, the Monash University uh, Graduate Diploma of Psychology. All right, thank you, and continue to engage those great comments with uh, Chiara and Oscar, and we'll see you in the next one. See you later.